Hey everyone, this is Adam Ellenboss from Nightlight Astrology, and today we are going to finish our series on the meanings of the houses for the stages of early life or childhood, as well as later life, say retirement and beyond. But, you know, more broadly speaking, this series can really be used as a way of understanding the meanings of the houses outside of, let's say, sort of like career focused and you know, for, for people, who, you know, there's a, there's like a very standard normative way of looking at house meanings. And then there are broader, more universal and archetypal ways of looking at them that can really be applied more broadly for people who don't fit neatly into some box or who are in a stage of life that doesn't fit with like your typical forecast or horoscope. So I hope that this will be, you know, uh, just received in that spirit. Here's some broader ways of looking at the houses. And if you missed the first two parts of the series, we looked at the angular houses and the succeedant houses. And now we're finishing the series with the cadent or declining houses. And I just had a few other things I wanted to finish before I did this one. Also, because I, I honestly believe that the declining houses or the cadent houses are the most universal and easiest to understand for all people at all stages of life. Succeeding and angular houses lend themselves a little bit more, for example, to talking about things like money and career and that kind of like middle life stage that most consumers of astrology find themselves in. Uh, but I think that this series, in particular, looking at the cadent houses in this series will be something that it's like, again, it's like the most universal of the house meanings. Anyway, that is that is our uh, objective for the day. So before we get into it, if you're new to the channel, don't forget to like and subscribe. We'd love to uh, uh, have you as a subscriber to the channel. And uh, liking the video, of course, helps build the channel. We really appreciate that. If you want, you can find a transcript of my daily talks, including today's, on the website nightlightastrology.com. I want to take you over there right now to the website because we are in enrollment season again. We have two enrollment seasons per year. And the new course, the first year course, begins again on November 18th. So you're going to go to the courses tab, click on the first year course, scroll down, and you can learn more about the program. We have just about all the information you would need to understand what the program is about, what it covers. Listed here on the page, there's an interview with some alumni. I think we're going to have some more alumni on uh, my show here uh, in the next couple of weeks. 30 courses on the year. We start from the ground up. This is a course in ancient Hellenistic astrology. But because I have a background in modern archetypal astrology, I practiced uh, evolutionary astrology for a while at the beginning of my career, you'll find that there is there are a lot of crossovers to modern archetypal um, and psychological astrology built into the program. But it is a course in ancient Hellenistic astrology. And it really the course is really about giving you an understanding of the why. Okay, here's how you understand the houses, the planets, the signs, aspects, dignities, but why? And once you have that understanding of why, you have an understanding with which to become much more intuitive, improvisational, um, and artful with the way that you read charts, including your own. If you're just taking this course for yourself and something that you can do to deepen your understanding of your own birth chart, that's smart. It's just like reading the user manual to a very complicated GPS system. It's good to do so because the more you know about it, the more you can use it to your benefit. But also some people want to practice professionally and this course is designed to meet that goal as well. We have a certification, uh, track that you can take at the end of the program you take an exam and get certified through our school at the bottom you will find that there are different payment options um there is the early bird payment plan saves you 500 dollars off there's a 12-month payment plan if you want to stretch the tuition out over a year and then there is need-based tuition assistance so that is for people who want to take the program but need a little help to get there um over the course of 13 years of teaching this program we've like some somewhere between 50 and 60 percent of our students have been on need-based tuition at this point we we estimate maybe even a little bit higher so we welcome people of diverse economic and financial backgrounds and situations because we don't want people to feel like you know somehow studying astrology is only for people who have certain amount of money we feel like anyone who really wants the study should be able to. So if you need a little bit of help to make it happen within your means, please apply now for the tuition assistance. We'd be glad to help you out. Uh, the program is also great because we have a lot of tutoring options and bonus material. We have a tutoring staff that meets outside of class 
for extra um, study sessions. We have a, a discussion forum staffed with tutors, tons of bonus materials. So the course is really there to set you up for success. It is the first of four years worth of programming that we offer uh, through the Nightlight Astrology School. Uh, my staff and I do the best we can to prepare people for a life of professional practice uh, or a, just a, a life lived with astrology at uh, um, with a much deeper level of understanding. If you have any questions about anything as you're looking over the program, email us, info at nightlightastrology.com. Again, we start November 18th and can't wait to see you there. Okay, so today the Cadent House meetings. And we're looking at these in terms of Kind of the, the stereotypical meanings that you might hear, but um, also how these meanings can be understood most broadly so that you can apply them and understand them at any stage of life. How does your eight-year-old experience a ninth house transit or a twelfth house transit? Or how might you experience it at 75? Or at any other stage in life, um, you know, how can we understand this outside of say the 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 kind of again, I almost want to call them like astronormative um <laughs> Uh, ways of relating to the houses. So I'm going to try to, the, the, the nice thing about the cadent houses, like I said earlier, is that they sort of are the most universal and the least tethered to the normal world of like seeking love and seeking, you know, employment or success in your career or money or, you know, whatever, buying a house or, or having kids or something, which are like a lot of the things that people come to astrology asking questions about. Um, so these houses in particular were called declining houses. And the reason that they are called declining houses is very simple. You're looking at house 12, house 9, house 6, and house 3. And the thing that is most interesting about them is that if you think about the wheel as moving clockwise, that's the primary motion of the sky that will bring, for example, in the real-time clock that I have right now, you know, Libra is rising. So what will happen is the whole sign house of Libra will become the 12th house and then the 11th and the 10th and the 9th and it moves clockwise like that around the wheel. That is called the primary or diurnal motion that rotates it that way. So when you have a birth chart and you're looking at houses 12, 9, 6, and 3, they're called declining or cadent. Cadent means falling, same kind of idea as the word declining. Falling or declining away from the angle. The angular houses are houses 1, 10, 7, and 4. And so when you have uh, whole signs that are in 12, 9, 6, and 3, what we're saying is that if you back this clock up one whole click, all of those cadent houses, declining or falling houses, have fallen away from the angle. The most recently, if you back the clock up, they were the angular in the angular positions. House 12 was most recently house 1. House 9 was most recently house 10. 6 was most recently 7. And 3 was most recently 4. But the clock has kept turning and they have fallen out of that position. So these houses are called declining or cadent, which means falling, because they have fallen or declined out of the seat of power. The, these houses, the uh, angular houses, were sometimes mentioned as krematistikos in Greek, which basically means like a a place that speaks loudly or as it's an oracular spot that has like a megaphone in the chart. And so the angular houses were considered very loud and vocal. If you have planets in those places, they speak to the native's fate or destiny very loudly. And they are tethered to the world. That's why in Indian astrology, the first house, Dharma, the 10th house, Arta, the seventh house, Kama, the fourth house, Moksha, the major four major philosophical pursuits of life duty and character development, uh, the pursuit of power, prestige, mastery, um, uh, success and recognition, the pursuit of pleasure or bliss, and the pursuit of uh, enlightenment or release from worldly concerns altogether. So these four areas of life are constituting the pursuits of the angular houses. They're called krematistikos in Greek, again, which means like loud when you're looking at the declining or cadent places, the planets have slid away from and are in a kind of reflective but related relationship with the angle and its topics. And so that means something very particular for each of the cadent places. And this is something we take, you know, 12 hours to unpack in my year one program. Uh, so we're just doing a really brief treatment here. But let's start with house 12. 
So in house 12, the planet is in a kind of, um, whoops, here we go. Uh, in house 12, the planet is in a kind of reflective but distanced relationship from the first house. And that means the planet has declined away from the first house and is looking at it by its secondary motion. It's sort of moving toward Libra or the first place, the angle, but by primary motion, it's been brought away from it. So that was a symbolic astronomical picture for ancient astrologers of something that has lost uh, its ability to hold on to the steering wheel of the chart. The first house was called the helm, uh, and it was the place where the natives' agency, their intelligence, their body, their free will is paramount. Now, a planet in the 12th house is sort of has fallen out of that position is, and is looking at it reflectively, but from a pulled away distance. And so for that reason, the 12th house is associated with a loss of control, a loss of agency, a loss of sanity, a loss of health, a loss of freedom, and the desire or attempt or hope to get it back. It's also associated with all of those things that are considered to be like lost parts of us or parts that we can't see or don't understand or subtle forces that might undermine us because we don't have control over them or we don't have a more conscious relationship with them. So this is why I started off by saying that these house meanings are the most universal. In fact, all cadent houses were called metacosmios in Greek as well, which means kind of like a world between worlds or a kind of liminal space. The 12th house is probably the most difficult insofar as it represents all those things which elude or evade the native's understanding or control. And therefore, while it can be very spiritually enlightening to get in touch with that unconscious material, it is often very difficult and challenging. The 12th house doesn't have an aspectual relationship with the first in ancient astrology, so it's considered to be averse from the ascendant. That also would mean that things in this house are like located in a kind of blind spot for the native. All of this in mind, this, this is why I said these meanings are sort of universal and already by their very definition sort of transcend stages or ages of life. From the time that you're a little child, you have things you don't understand that you're afraid of that are little parts of your personality that are, you know, more unconscious. And I, you know, I can see this already in my, in my kids who are just, you know, five and seven. So, um, and, but it, it, it can be, it can look a little bit different to grapple with 12th house material in childhood. For example, in childhood, a 12th house transit or planet might show up as undermining or unconscious, disturbing, challenging elements in the environment that are outside of your control that stand as real um, shadows or the seeds of shadow material that you'll deal with later in life. Alcoholism in the family, for example, or deaths in the family, or maybe you were adopted and you don't know your, who your birth family was. And it may not be till much later in life that you have some deeper understanding of, you know, what that um, lack of contact with your birth mother was or something like that. I'm just making this up. But, um, and similarly, it doesn't really matter what stage of life you're in, you're always going to be looking at or working with unconscious material. As far as I can tell, there's no difference between 35 and, and 75 in that respect. Every client I've ever seen is still working with unconscious material, right? <laughs> right? Things that elude our understanding, are clear, uh, that we don't have control of, that we're, we're working on, that constitute our fears, our shadows, the unconscious, unintegrated parts that we uh, are grappling with that we're afraid of or that we don't understand. Um, sometimes they are our own worst enemies, the things in the 12th house. Other times they are the hidden angels that we're afraid of, but are seeking expression within us. You know, I really honestly, throughout all stages uh, of life, I don't see a huge amount of difference between how 12th house stuff shows up. I would say that maybe the biggest difference is earlier in life when, you know, we don't quite have the psychological sophistication to be like looking at my own unconscious material as like a five-year-old, you know, or as like an eight-year-old or something. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not there and that it's not at, at play somehow. And often earlier in life, 12th house material sent, seems to show up as other people, places, things, events, um, et cetera, as opposed to say, 
maybe starting late teen years through all the way through adulthood, where you have maybe a little bit more of a chance that that material that shows up in the 12th house is something that at least in part belongs to your own um, unconscious choices, habits, behaviors, modes of perception, and so forth. But don't let's not get it twisted. At any stage in life, the 12th house could show up as someone else, not just, it's like, we don't want to think, sometimes you'll hear the phrase self-undoing. Well, yeah, maybe. But um, there's also, you know, like if you, if you had a, if you grew up in a, in a family with a sibling that was um, a drug addict and going in and out of jail or something, that could show up in the 12th, the ruler of the third could show up in the 12th or something like that. Or if you had a sister that was really troubled and, uh, you know, taking your parents' attention away from you constantly, you could have Venus in the 12th who rules sisters or Mars, which rules brothers. So, you, you know, there's so many different ways in which unconscious and somewhat undermining material can show up. And it's not always just your own crap. You know what I mean? Especially again in childhood, you'll see that it's often not the kid, but something in the environment that they're contending with that may start to shape their their psychology or behavior, which is why as astrologers, it's great if you know some astrology to be really aware of what's in your kid's 12th house, because then you can you can be a little bit more on the lookout for that pattern um, that might start to take root and you know almost like meld itself to their character, but it's actually coming from some kind of conditioning that you're, you know, you're contributing to as a parent It'd be really helpful to understand 12th house material in that, in that sense. Um, you know, but yeah, in maybe later in life, uh, one thing that I have noticed is that 12th house material becomes more familiar to us. We've encountered it over and over again. In ancient Greek, the house was called malas daimon, uh, which means evil spirit. Um, but this, you have to understand too, that like, you know, almost like the book of Job, where, you know, evil, good and evil are not seen in this kind of like, you know, e eternal duking it out for the the champion of the universe. Good and evil are sort of um, much more relative everyday terms, uh, you know, stubbing your toe and being in a bad mood <laughs> might be kind of like there's evil influence in the air, you know. Um, Whereas, you know, good, good spirit or, you know, uh, the good daimon might be a little bit more like, oh, things are kind of flowing along nicely and, and working out or conspiring for the good or something. So you, you don't want to think about evil in a super like, I just want to say like a super dualistic kind of Christian way. But you want to think about evil more as like just a, a word that we have used over time to denote the, the kind of, you know, almost like bad luck or just bad vibes and as as well as the need to understand those things and to explore the unconscious and make it conscious, so to speak, uh, which is not really a process of making something bad into something good. And and so at, at a certain point, the the word the, the phrase evil spirit becomes sort of um, unhelpful. But it's also not something to be ignored because you will find that some of your demons do live in the 12th house, you know, demons and shadows is, is an appropriate way at times of talking about the 12th house. Later in life, that might change a little bit, you get a little bit better at your shadow material, you, or you get a little bit more familiar with it, and you kind of know what you're dealing with. So I have noticed that, say, my older clientele from maybe 50 onward, um, are just going to be veterans when it comes to dealing with 12th house material. Of course, some people and I just I don't mean to be trite, because like, what do I know? I'm just, I'm just a whippersnapper, you know, but I, I would say some people never learn. Like, it's amazing to me that sometimes, you know, I'll work with older clients and I'm like, I'll go back through five, six transits over, over this course of 40 years to the 12th house. It's like the exact same thing keeps happening. And there's no insight. There's just um, like a very, um, sometimes it's kind of a victim, like, poor me, this thing keeps happening. And I'm like, geez, I would think that by this age, you know, we would do a little bit more reflecting and be able to see at least part of our own participation in the pattern. I don't think that everything is like, I create everything or that everything just happens to me from the outside. I think it's a real interesting and mysterious dance between our choices and external um, influences, you know? So, but I'm just surprised that, you know, sometimes it's true. People will be dealing with the same old stuff and not really learning or having any insight into it even later in life. So, it's not like it, it, oh, well, just because you're older means somehow your 12th house stuff gets easier. Most of the time, though, I would say it does. Like most of my clientele as they age seem to get 
a little better at doing 12th house stuff. It's also a place that forces us to lose control or give up control on some level. And that act of surrender to things that are in the unconscious um, is, you know, kind of part of that dark night of the soul or encounter with suffering that almost all spiritual veterans can speak to, you know, or in all traditions have spoken about. So again, that does seem to be like a mark of spiritual experience is that you are better at doing 12th house stuff or you're better at knowing how to move through it. It may still come up, but you know how to work with it. Okay. Well, it's very important to understand too, that in ancient astrology, there was no conflation between planets, houses, and signs. So the 12th has nothing to do with Neptune or Pisces. Um, that's not a thing in ancient astrology. The rationale for the meanings of the houses is not linked to any one-to-one -one correlation with the 12 signs. They have a totally separate um, rationale for how they're understood. <laughs> Got some allergies going on here. Sorry. Okay. So let's continue. I'm going to put the sun in the ninth house. So that's a bit about the 12th house. Now the ninth house is interesting because the ninth place is declining away from the 10th. Now remember the 10th was called praxis or action. Uh, it's related to the worldly activities that we take up in the society in which we were born. And uh, <laughs> so um, the ninth house has this kind of reflective relationship with the 10th. So the ninth was called God. It was called the joy of the sun. The 12th was called evil spirit it was called the joy of Saturn, by the way. This place also metacosmio, uh, metacosmia, meaning not so tethered to the world, a little otherworldly. And again, I find that this house has almost universal application for all stages of life. As the ninth has pulled away from uh, the place that is associated with um, success, mastery, recognition, fame, uh, development of your reputation, career, worldly activities, anything that tethers you to the world in action, this place exists in a reflective relationship with it. It gets a much more positive meaning than the 12th because this house, unlike the 12th, has aspectual relationship by trine to the first house. And so that aspectual relationship between any house and the ascending house generally lent itself to more, would lend itself to more positive meanings. Anyway, um, so this house reflects upon the actions and activities of the world and the greater society in which we live. <clears throat> that would mean, for example, that this place reflects upon human action with a desire to understand its meaning, to understand the laws that govern it. So this is the place of religion, of mysticism. You have to remember in the ancient world that math, science, art, music, all were connected. And this is uh, also, this was brought back, this kind of interconnected, interdisciplinary, universal uh, spirit of education in the Renaissance, which is bringing back of the ancient Greek sort of ethos. Well, you have a, um, in the ninth house, you have a active reflection upon the activities and pursuits of mankind that exist in the 10th house all of their aspirations and goals and so forth. And in this house there, you're reflecting upon them, which is why we have the study of astronomy, math, science, religion, uh, spirituality, mysticism, astrology. This was the place of the gods and oracles, places where you gain higher insight and perspective as to why we're here or what any of this is about or why we pursue the things that we pursue that exist in the 10th house. And so, this is a place of higher meaning, of higher learning, of the pursuit of wisdom and the gods, of religion and mysticism and astrology itself. So this house has that kind of universal meaning, again, that all of the cadent or declining houses have. They're not so tethered to the world and therefore lend themselves more easily to all stages and ages of life because they're universal in that sense. Um, it, whether you're a child or an adult, there will be a gradual, uh, sometimes accelerated or explosive, you know, depending on transits and so forth, interest in 
what makes the world work the way that it does, why people are here, what does it all mean? Um, my you know, five and seven year old are actively interested in these subjects, actively interested in astrology. I sit down, I have a little whiteboard that I use. It's like this little whiteboard with markers. And I draw the glyphs of the planets and teach them about the meanings of the planets. And we have little lessons and they love it. They absolutely love it. And I can say, I can say to, um, I can ask my five year old, literally, I can say, why do you think that the sun is associated with birth and death? and rebirth. Why is the sun associated with something that is born and then dies and then is reborn? What does the sun do every day that's like that? And my five-year-old can look at me and goes, well, it rises and it sets and then it, it goes away and then it comes back again. I'm so impressed. You know, so I will tell you right now, I, I think that there, one of the things I've learned about kids and having kids, you know, I, I hadn't spent the world, the most time in the world with children before having, um, our own. One thing that I've observed about children is that it, fr from the time we are very, very little, many children are actively interested in questions about God, divinity, the universe, the soul, where do we go when we die? Why do we die? All sorts of things. So I see it. I see the ninth house as innate and not just belonging to like, the university years and beyond, you know, you know, it's like, it's not like, it's not like you and David Attenborough, once you reach 21, start endeavoring to understand everything about the way nature works. But uh, rather that you, as soon as you have eyes to see and you look around and you start, you see the activities of humankind, dad goes to work and or mom goes to work. And then this happens, you have cars and there's traffic and there's stop all this stuff. And you go, well, like why, and how does it work? And, it's natural. So there is no stage of life where we aren't asking those questions, where we aren't constantly befuddled, enlightened, and then befuddled all over again. This is a house of the signs and omens of the gods, as well as their the riddles that they present us with. Uh, this is a house that was associated with the sun insofar as it's a place of illuminating and higher intelligence. It is at a reflective distance from the world and its activities. And that for many people will actually describe a good part of their lifetime. You know, for example, the moon in my chart is in the ninth house. So a huge amount of my lifetime with one of the luminaries will be spent in that environment. I grew up a preacher's kid in the church looking at the stained glass windows. I used to break into the church at night with my dad's keys. I guess it's not breaking in, but I wasn't supposed to. So I would take his keys and I would go into the church and I'd have the whole place to myself and I just walk around and I would sit in the dark sanctuary and I would just have the church as my playground because I needed some place at night, this moon in the ninth house to just reflect on what is all of this? What is it to me? Not what am I being told on Sundays, but like I needed some personal experience of it. Some, I don't know, a little bit of ownership, I guess. I mean, it was real deviant. <laughs> it was really like mischievous in another way, but it was that those are some of my most powerful memories of childhood it was a period in junior high where I started taking the keys late at night after my parents were asleep, taking my bicycle, riding under the cover of night, going into the church and just wandering around, looking through all sorts of things that, you know, I never otherwise would have had access to asking those questions. Why are we here? What is this all about? That ninth house, I, I honestly, I can't there. It is there from the time you're a child, the time you're an adult, you know, and, and it can change certainly like our, our religious experiences aren't the same at, you know, 75 as they are at five, but in a way they are in a way, there's really no difference. I think, uh, in a way the ninth house is childlike in so far as, um, well, I mean, sometimes people can develop a real righteous certainty about stuff that can be very ninth house like, but Insofar as the house appeals to all ages, all stages, all walks of life, it is just about asking, why am I here? How am I orienting myself through the lens of beliefs or belief systems or something like that? So <clears throat> pilgrimage too, associated with the ninth house or travel abroad. Um, but generally speaking, you're, you're gaining some distance from the normal world or um, the normal activities of the the city you live in or the state or country you live in, and you're getting some reflective distance from it. And that's why it's also associated with travel and pilgrimage. So uh, 
Okay, let's go on. Nothing to do with Sagittarius. Not that's not where the meaning comes from. There's interesting, you know, connections that can be made or associations. So that's not where the rationale comes from. All right, let's get on to the sixth house. I'm putting the sun in each of these houses, I guess. I don't know why. Uh, okay, well, let's look at the sixth. So the sixth has that same kind of cadent falling, declining relationship with the seventh house. It has fallen out of that angle and is looking at it, but from a distance. <clears throat> seventh was called comma, which means bliss or uh, ecstasy, you know, happiness, pleasure, especially with other people. This house, because planets had traveled through the whole sky from rising to culminating to setting was also called uh, the conclusion of work and, and rest and relaxation belong to this house. So the pursuit of pleasure that is represented by the evening or the nocturnal space. So planets in the sixth are trying to get back to a place they've fallen out of. They're looking at it, but from a reflective distance. And this house, like the twelfth, does not have an aspectual relationship with the first. It is called, it's in an aversion to the first house. So considered to be more difficult again. This place was called Mala Fortuna or bad fortune. And it was also called the joy of Mars. So this house is associated with the frustration that we feel in trying to reach a state of peace, happiness, bliss, rest, conclusion of work, but we're unable to do so. We've been pulled away from that state of rest and we're unable to uh, get back to it. So this house, not surprisingly, is associated with work and frustration and labor and toil and chronic conditions or things that we have to sacrifice or work in service to with a, a good amount of blood, sweat, and tears. So it can be a very sacrificial house. A lot of hard work is done in this house, um, laboring or suffering nobly toward things that we believe in or things that we fight for, things that we um, suffer on behalf of, or things that we selflessly sacrifice for. Mars, of course, in part is related to the um, idea of martyrdom where the, they share the root mar and martyr. So um, this place can have a kind of noble, self-sacrificial serving quality. It's unable to reach peaceful resolution. And so it carries a kind of burden perpet perpetually, a suffering servant in the sixth house. Uh, or people who fight, like this house was associated with soldiers and warfare and military service. Um, it's also associated with like laborers and it was associated with slavery and indentured servitude and anything that would be like a kind of like the shackles of hard work and also chronic health conditions that don't resolve. Why? Because everything in this house has been pulled away from the place of peaceful resolution in the seventh house, the completion of work and the enjoyment and pleasure uh, of the seventh house, not there. So that doesn't mean everything in the sixth is bad, but again, the meanings here are pretty universal. As far as I can tell from the time we're little to the time that we're, you know, of, of an older age, um, the sixth house struggles continue. You sacrifice on behalf of things you love. You sweat and bleed for things you care about. And that doesn't stop. That's a part of life, no matter what age or stage you're in. Sometimes again, in earlier childhood, before we have such a conscious sense of what we want to work or fight for or believe in or sacrifice for or serve or work hard toward, the sixth house will show up as the afflictions or obstacles that are frustrating or overwhelming that are starting to teach us perseverance or that are starting to teach us the value of hard work or sacrifice or that present themselves as kind of chronic frustrating conditions that are in some ways training us to be strong. Um, that's a very positive way of looking at it. On other times, you know, the sixth house, depending on what's in there or what's ruling it, can show up as the kinds of uh, health afflictions that we have, or it can show up as, you know, like sometimes the moon in the sixth shows up because you had a, a single mom who was at the poverty line, you know, just working her butt off. And that was the environment you grew up in with your mother. Um, sometimes the sixth house will also show up. You got a couple of planets in there that indicate that, hey, you know, I've got parents who uh, really believed in something morally, politically, spiritually, and they were kind of suffering servants on behalf of what they cared about. So it's also about th for when you're younger, like the 12th house, it's a bit more about things that are in the environment that are giving you those kinds of sixth house uh, initial um, 
hardships or service projects and showing you what it looks like to have to suffer through something. Now, the worst is when you have, you know, a lot of afflicted planets in there in a ch- in, in a child's chart can sometimes show up as okay, there was there were some losses and hardships and struggles uh early on that I had no control over, you know, that set me up to start believing that life is hard. And sometimes it takes a lot of work for us to realize that you know, I don't just have to survive. Um I don't just have to uh, chop wood and carry water my whole life or um, bleed and sacrifice or overcome and persevere. Uh, these are great. These are actually the sixth house. Like for all of us who believe in anything or want to get good at anything, you got to kind of do your sixth house. But my point is that children don't, sometimes it, it's like stuff that's more out of their control earlier in life. Later in life, you'll see more of a sense of a, a person's own agency and involvement with sixth house things. That's the most general thing I could say about the uh, presence of the sixth house in childhood. Um, but it can be that way throughout life. You know, you, if you have your, like in this chart, you can see right now, if this were a birth chart, the seventh house ruler is in the sixth with the south node. That could mean that the spouse or marriage partner has like a, a health problem. And that's a challenge that you somehow are, you know, are are uh, overcoming or working with as much as they might be. So you could describe something that's challenging for them, but also a challenge that is going to be part of your life. Now, I'm just making that up. There would be other, many other signif- uh, potential uh, delineations of that. But <clears throat> as far as I can tell, the delineation really doesn't change later in life. I mean, maybe later in life, it's more common to see physical health afflictions showing up through sixth house placements or transits as the natural process of aging occurs and chronic health problems are just a part of, you know, moving toward the exit ramp of this lifetime. Uh, the body breaks down. It's a very sixth house like thing, but also there's no less amount of sacrifice service and things that we are passionate about passion to suffer alongside of the passion of, of Mars in the sixth house is to suffer for things that we care about. As far as I can tell, that doesn't really change at any stage in life in terms of its its relevance or importance to the soul. People who are retired are certainly, um, you know, being grandparents, suffering alongside of their 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 children and and still helping their children out through the challenges of their own middle lives and whatever else. Um, and there's causes and there's religious practices and there's service projects and there's art and hobbies that, you know, are going to show up as things that we burn for and with that we that we sort of serve and suffer with. So that's a, a pretty, again, really universal, a, a metacosmia type of environment. It's not when we suffer with things, it feels like we want to get to a place of flow. This is not a place of flow as much as it is a place of enduring and persevering and sort of chugging along in choppy waters. So that's a part of life that we all deal with energetically at all ages and stages, if that makes sense. Okay, let's go to the last of the cadent houses, which is house three. And I'm going to put the sun in there again, I guess. (laughs) I don't know why I started doing that, but I guess it works. All right, so we have now the third house has fallen out of the fourth by primary motion and by secondary motion, it's sort of looking at that fourth house, but it's been pulled away. Now this house has a sextile to the ascendant. So more positive meanings generally the sextile to the ascendant, as well as the sort of reflective distance from the fourth house makes this uh, a pretty positive place. It was called the joy of the moon, or it was called um, goddess as opposed to, the opposite house called God and the joy of the sun. Third is called goddess and joy of the moon. Now, the moon, very broadly speaking, was called fortune and presided over the everyday environment and the fluctuations and changes of the environment, just as surely as the moon is always waxing and waning and moving more quickly than any other planet and disseminating the lights of all the other planets through that many aspects that it makes as it moves so quickly through the zodiac. 
So the moon came to represent the everyday environment and its fluctuations and changes. Now, the fourth place that the third is in reference to is called the resting place, the subterranean pivot, the place of home. And remember, the fourth house associated with moksha, release from the world. So you go home after you work and you release, you relax, you go to sleep at night. But you also find that resting place, that kind of homeostasis and flow uh, in the fourth house, very similar in a sense to the seventh house. Seven and four have a lot in common insofar as pleasure and liberation from the world have, there's something in common there. But moksha is a little bit more like uh, this, this bigger universal idea of release, even in, as in enlightenment. But the fourth house associated with parents, roots, home, release from worldly concerns or cares. Um, and uh, so the third house, as it adjoins the fourth, but is at a kind of reflective distance, is about everything that circulates around, orbits around the roots, like a little satellite, like the moon. And thus the third is, is maybe the most like all encompassing and like non-specific house, which is why it can be frustrating to describe third house planets. It literally is describing the ebb and flow of everything in the immediate environment that surrounds your roots. This is why it's associated with neighborhood. This is why it's associated with uh, neighbors and siblings. Why? Because siblings all disperse outward, but still constellate around the roots of the parents, which are located in the fourth. You have third house, um, third house topics like siblings, neighbors, the immediate environment, um, the local folk customs of your city or village. Uh, you have everything that is kind of swimming. It's like the, I, I've said this multiple times before on this channel, the third house is like the water that the fish are swimming in. You don't even recognize it. So the third house has a lot to do also with the environment of our body, our mind, our thoughts, our emotions. And it's just kind of like the, the third house is a little bit like a mood ring that you're wearing and you're not even, you don't even know that you're wearing it. You know, you're just like uh, one of those squids that changes colors or whatever. So um, this is an interesting one because I will say that this has some really distinct features at different ages of life. For example, the earlier you are in life, the more unconscious you tend to be about what's in the environment. And this is also the moon in general will often show up as more of the, you know, sort of sometimes you've heard psychological astrologers say that the moon will show up as a kind of early unconscious identification that the child has. Whereas the older they get, the more self-reflective that, that they become, oftentimes to kind of grow into an awareness of the life path as described by the sun. Uh, whereas the moon is just kind of like what you naturally fall into as a matter of just, just the kind of unconscious default setting. <laughs> It's not means that it's better or worse or that, that you should go toward the sun and leave the moon behind. It's we're not, it's nothing like that. It's just the moon is so natural. It's so connect, it's what connects us to the environment, the home. It's it's very it's much more like a homeostasis setting. So things in the third house for children will often be very much a part of the unconscious flow in the environment. Now you could see really difficult things in that space. And Yet still in childhood, it may take a little bit longer before you become aware of what kind of impact they've had on you, right? Um, but also as life goes on, the third house becomes about what we want or don't want in our environment, in our thoughts, our, our mind, our emotions, and our body. Uh, what kind of influences exist around us culturally uh, that are positive or negative or those that we identify with or don't identify with? For example, I think this is really interesting. Um, my uh, sister has a Capricorn moon in the third house, which means it's a moon that's in the opposite sign of its own domicile, Some kind, sometimes called an exiled moon. But the exile isn't really always the right word. It just represents a kind of archetypal tension. My sister has lived in and found herself identified with the cultures of other people from other parts of the world since she was in high school. She's lived abroad and um, and she's marrying uh, um, an Indian man where her wedding is later this month. We're really excited. She's got a, she's going to be, uh, you know, it's like a big Indian wedding for all of my Indian friends out there. You know how exciting and elaborate Indian weddings are, many days of activities. So I find it interesting that ever since she was little, she's always been interested in cultures other than her own. There is a moon in the sign opposite to its own domicile in that third house. Fascinating, right? 
but at any rate, there's, and there's many other ways that you can see that kind of thing in the third house too. But, um, so she, uh, and she lives, um, her soon to be spouses, uh, Indian family lives with them too. So it's like, uh, she's just steeped in a culture that's very different from the one she grew up in. That's a very like moon in, uh, in the sign opposite its own domicile in the third house. Right. So in so many interesting other ways of looking at the third house, I guess millions of stories, you know, from my career um, and seeing clients. But the point is that the third will be about the culture, the environment, the mind, the mood. And as far as I can tell, again, like you have some, maybe especially in childhood, those those characteristics, like the third house has such a huge role to play in how the environment shapes us psychologically uh, as we're growing. This is why it's called the joy of the moon. As life goes on, it's definitely true in my experience that as you get a little bit older, you start becoming more conscious of the influence of those factors. And a lot of the work of therapy, for example, that has to do with understanding childhood or family influences is third house work. People always say that it's fourth house work. And in a sense, it is because the fourth house can be very telling when it comes to family and parental influences in particular. But if you want to know about the culture that you were raised in and the all different kinds of environmental factors and how they shaped your mind, body, thinking, perceptions, communication patterns. You look at the third house. It's really so much of like modern therapy that we look back on our childhood as third house work. Um, I, I have a cancer son and mercury and cancer in the third house. And I went to graduate school for creative writing, specifically studying memoir. And then I wrote a book about the history of my family. Uh, and the influences of the environment religiously and spiritually and so forth. Well, my third house ruler is the moon in the ninth uh, in Capricorn. So I have the opposite. I have the moon in the ninth, whereas my sister has it in the third. And I wrote about my roots and the ability to reflect upon them religiously came from experiences that I had, religious experiences in other countries, especially India and Peru. I mean, you you know, so I'm just trying to give you guys some examples, but Maybe again, like middle life, you become a little bit more aware of what's going on in the third house and you have a more active role in shaping it or changing it. Like I would say there's the most like feng shuiing of uh, your third house that happens in like middle life. I feel like in later life, this is just my reflection. I'm not saying that this is the only way of thinking about it, but I've certainly seen that my clients, the later in life they get have become most of my clients, because people who do astrology are, you know, generally speaking, they've adopted some spiritual practices. They maybe they've done therapy. They're trying to live a kind of reflective lifestyle. Later in life, the third house, you have, you've arranged it more. You've gotten, you've probably placed yourself in a culture or an environment that you're, you feel more suited to, or at the very least, you've, you've learned to stay away from ones that aren't so good for you. Um, and you're thinking or you're perceiving your emotions, your mind-body connection, and how they influence the uh, experience that you have of your everyday life, you'll have gained more, you'll be like a, more of a veteran, you'll gain more wisdom about that. So, so the ninth and third houses progressively, there's a way in which we develop wisdom around them both. You know, the third house is very earthy. It's very the wisdom of mind and body and environment. And that's why it's called goddess and the wisdom of the goddess. Well, the ninth house called God, it's a little bit more like, you know, my practice of, uh, you know, chanting mantra that I, I've had or meditation practices or ayahuasca or, you know, studying the Tao Te Ching, the Tao Te Ching or um, the I Ching or astrology or kind of the bigger universal questions. For me, there's always a lot of mystery around those things. I reach little plateaus of certainty and then they fall away beneath my feet and I'm, you know, free falling all over again. And the third house is kind of like, you know, there's spring cleaning that happens. There's a, there's a constant rearranging that happens as you, as the environment, as you change in different stages of life, you're kind of constantly rearranging your third house. So, um, I think it's an, uh, the third house in that sense is an ongoing process, just like the moon is constantly waxing and waning. Well, anyway, that is, uh, that's what I have to say about the third house. And again, metacosmia, very applicable through all stages of life. Um, but I think, uh, you know, especially the third house in childhood there, you know, you really are looking at those things that are going to be, the kids are not going to know that this is the water they're swimming in as fish, you know, and they, that, that gradually starts to dawn on them as they get older. And it's a pretty, um, it's really a pretty amazing to see how, um, 
how reflective we have to become about the third house in order to feel like happier and more comfortable in our own skin. And I think a lot of therapy work happens around the third house, even though I think a lot of us have been taught in modern astrology to think that that's all fourth house stuff. So anyway, food for thought. I hope that you found this series interesting and that the final episode gave everyone a, a, a deeper, more universal understanding of the cadence or declining houses so that, um, you know, you don't feel like you're, when we do horoscopes, sometimes you just have to hit on like the big, easy, obvious stuff because you're speaking to so many people simultaneously. So you kind of have to go for an easy bottom line. Um, and I wish that I could just like articulate all of this stuff about each house as we talked about each house, but then I'd have like six hour horoscopes and I, I don't have time. <laughs> so, but now that you know, these house meanings, you can always remember these things whenever I talk about, well, this is in your third house and you'll hear me kind of like in the horoscopes that I do, you'll hear me sort of tapping into little deeper, more universal themes with all of the houses and having this, having had these houses illuminated in this way, I hope that therefore you will be able to take more out of those horoscopes. And especially that people who don't fall into one age stage or category will feel like they have an understanding that, you know, meets, that meets all of you where you are. So anyway, that's it for today. Hope you guys are having a good one and we will see you again soon.